Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to answer a subscriber's question. So again, I'm really sorry. This question came from July 2020. Uh, we're like, I don't know, six, seven months, maybe eight months past this, but let's just dive on in. This is probably one of the most challenging questions for me to answer, so bear with me. I'll try to be concise, but it might tend to be a longer answer. Um, somebody asked, hi Dimitri. I'm a second year economics undergrad entering my final year. I just finished Ed Thorpe's uh, A Man of All Markets, and I'm in the middle of The Man Who Solved the Markets by Gregory Zuckerman. These two books just made me want to do a math PhD before entering the financial services industry. Given this, I have two questions. Okay, so these are gonna kind of go together, but I'll try to answer them separately and kind of together at the same time. Um, one is how did you become so competent in quantitative areas of finance, you know, practice, naturally gifted, for example. And then also, and then second part is here, and what's your tips for me to become a top, top level, you know, quant basically, I guess that's kind of the first one. Second question is two, can expert level quant skills be achieved without being a math PhD? Thanks for your videos and your help. The channel is really insightful for someone like me. A uh, first generation undergrad and a previous journeyman electrician making the career change. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so to answer, let's answer the second one first. It's a lot easier to answer, okay? Uh, do you need a math PhD to be an expert level quant? No, you don't. Um, is it helpful? Could it take you a long ways? Yes, um, but the simple answer is that quantitative finance in general, so I'm boiling this down now over years and years of discussions and all this, uh, boiling down quantitative finance, it's really going to be um, applying scientific methods to finance, okay? Now, and I'm not going to get into the whole gatekeeping argument. That'll be for a whole nother discussion with a buddy of mine that I'm going to bring on as a guest here. But you have to set the bar somewhere, right? Like doing math, you could say, okay, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So arithmetic, that's math, right? So is that enough to be a quant? Probably not. I mean, you can add algebra and then calculus and then different layers of calculus and you know topology and all kinds of other things. So do you need a PhD specifically to do it? No, you do not. Do you need to understand math though quite well? Yes, but depending on your area of focus is going to depend on what type of math you need. Uh, and again, you might master that over a specific length of time. It might be a longer, I don't know, length of time. But in general, you're going to be building tools that are specific to whatever you're working in. And so a lot of careers you're going to get pigeonholed into one area, which I know many of you think is like a bad thing. Uh, but being kind of nailed down and doing something specific uh, is very beneficial and rewarding for a lot of quants because you become a very, very, I don't know, detailed expert here on exactly what you're doing for a living. So that's the easy answer. That's the second question. Uh, the first one's going to be like, how did I become, you know, so good at quantitative quantitative finance? Here, is it something that's gifted? Is it practice? Like, what is it? So this is going to be the challenging part here. Um, I'm going to lay out a few general concepts just just to get going here. So first here, if you look at scientific research, uh, IQ from the research that is currently available from the psychology community and those in the academic community, it looks like you cannot actually change your IQ. Okay, so that's just a, looks like a scientific fact. Now again, more research might come out that'll change that. However, so brace, hold on, hold on, hey, wait with me here. The, the caveat to this is I feel like a lot of people, so this isn't scientifically backed, this is my opinion. I feel like people have some sort of cap. So let's say, I don't know, your IQ cap is like, I don't know, 125 or something, okay? A lot of people I feel like they'll never reach their potential. So you could be born and have a really high IQ and yet you never really reach your potential of IQ just because you don't have an interest in developing it, okay? So for quants, right, we're all excited and like the big thing is like, oh, how smart are you? And that's what people like to focus on here. So I think for most people that end up wanting to go into quantitative finance, that do well in college, that get to that point, you're gonna have enough IQ to really do the job but I do think there is a limiting factor. It's not like anyone on the street can just walk out and like, I don't know, learn mathematics, statistics, you know, probability theory and computer science and programming and all that, throw it all together, apply it to finance and I can teach you like in a week, right? It's just not possible. Um, it takes years and years and years. It's why it takes like a master's or a PhD to even get in the field, right? It just takes time for anybody, no matter how smart you are, uh, to build all those skills up. So there's definitely, I think, like an IQ cap that kind of prevents 
people from coming into the industry as well. Um, but there's also that practice piece in developing your IQ. And then the other piece I wanna talk about here is I'm not a huge fan of IQ tests. So a lot of you know this. Um, I don't think IQ really matters on like, oh, where are you at on some scale of some sorts, but you need to have intelligence to get rolling as I mentioned, but also you need to be able to develop those skills and practice, practice, practice. Uh, I think it's far more predictive of how well a, somebody will do in quantitative finance is their perseverance, character, and a lot of the soft skills behind it. So this is kind of counterintuitive for many of you. But for example, when I talk to people, I'm like, oh, I've got, you know, I don't know, some textbook here, I'm sitting down and I'm reading it, and I've reread the thing like, I don't know, six times, I'm going through all these chapters, and I'm like taking notes and highlighting and everything. People look at me like I'm crazy, like, Dimitri, it's a textbook, I just read the textbook, and then I'm done with it, and I set it aside, right? And you're, you're finished. That's not how quant finance works, guys. It's all the little nitty gritty details inside of like building a model for something. So whether it's for trading or for risk management or for, you know, making loans or, you know, all kinds of problems you have here. Picking the right model is important, but also fine tuning and making the exact correct decisions makes a huge difference here. Okay. So I think it's both parts. You need IQ and you definitely need uh, practice, 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 and you really need some drive to really push through it and be somewhat enjoyable. If it's not enjoyable for you, you're not gonna be churning through textbooks on the weekend like I am. Like, I'm doing a book review, so that's part of it. But I mean, I'm reading more books and I wouldn't say this is not a textbook, but I've got textbooks sitting around here and I'm sitting here just reading books, going through the material, really analyzing the problem. Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? And then, you know, kind of wrapping that up here. So that's kind of my take on that here. Now, quant culture, I think, plays a big part into why I am who I am, okay? So a lot of this, again, is gonna come down to my personality. So things that are soft skills, things that I think you should develop, like character, for example, and perseverance and things like that, they're important pieces and having patience is something that I have very, very little of. I'm kind of like a, I don't know, loose cannon often, and so I spend a lot of time when I speak at work trying to think in my head before I speak, and then realizing like, they said something and it's wrong and it's irritating, and I don't know, maybe I, I don't think very much of this person. And then, so I want to just like cut to the chase, you know, and just cut them off and say, you're complete, this is complete trash. This is a dumb idea and explain why. But you have to be someone who builds a lot of these other personal skills with it. Um, so kind of talking about the quant culture piece of how it's developed me. When I started off, um, I worked in a, an area where I was not a model developer, okay? But I was brought into the meetings. They wanted my feedback. They wanted to kind of get me involved and help train me and kind of get me involved with everything. And they were doing things one way and I just kind of sat back quietly, right? I'm a new employee, I'm just kind of looking at it, reading my textbooks, right? I have my other full-time job I'm doing there as well, but I'm reading textbooks on the topic, trying to figure out like what's going on. And they, one of the, the heads of one of the development departments set me down in a meeting or chatting and he says, Demetri, you don't talk very often. You know, tell me what's wrong with this model right now. Like, what do you think it is, right? You don't need to be an expert, just tell me what you think it is. So I sat there and I was like, well, it looks like you're overfitting and I explained all this stuff. So again, this isn't machine learning, guys. This is statistics, you can overfit stats. It's not just a machine learning data science issue. So I explained the symptoms that they were having with the models. I explained why I thought it was overfitting. And the guy looked at it and goes, okay, that, that's a pretty good answer, thanks. And they just moved on, right? But over the next six months, seven months, eight months, all of a sudden that individual started nailing down on they have overfitting problems. They have overfitting problems and they just kept going through all these issues here. So it kind of gave me a little bit of boost of confidence, but I started sitting in more and more of these meetings and then they started becoming somewhat confrontational. So that was the head, which was fine. And then you had team members that were running teams, managing people. So think about like, I don't know, vice presidents or whatnot of these different, different groups here. And they're upset and they're telling me, Dimitri, you don't know what you're talking about. This is completely wrong, you know, and like just adamantly arguing with me in front of entire groups of people in meetings. And so being the quant that I am, so again, going back to those quanty skills and, you know, learning science and being excited, I whip out this textbook. So for those of you that know, this is my favorite textbook, or one of my favorite textbooks. Uh, it's Introductory Econometrics, A Modern Approach. It's super basic and it covers through a lot of advanced materials. Anyways, I'm sitting in this meeting and I've, 
have this book with me, okay? I'm sitting there and somebody's arguing with me. I'm standing up and I'm like yelling at this lady, basically telling her like, you're completely wrong and you're off base and this is exactly how it works. And she's like, you don't know anything, right? You don't have a PhD. Of course, they go after my education, which is fine. And she's like arguing with it and I go, fine, here's the textbook, let me show you. So I crack this thing open. And for those of you that know, I, I highlight in my books, as you can see in parts of this book, I pull open this book and I go, right here it states X, Y, and Z. You have to do it this way. There's no other way to do it. And then the lady that I was arguing with got her feelings hurt and got upset. But the guy that was the head of the department or head of that kind of area, he goes, really? Really, Dimitri? I've got, you know, the, the edition that's like, I don't know, it's either newer or older than mine. He goes, I've got that, that's, that same book, you know. Let me see that real quick. So I show him and he reads it and goes, okay, like, this makes sense. We got to change this. We got to do X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, I burned a bridge with that lady and she got her feelings hurt, which was fine, right? Perhaps I shouldn't have gone after her as hard as I did. But having those challenges, having those debates, that's what has made me so good at it. Because I have a belief system. I have, right, I've read these textbooks. I go through it. And then somebody challenges you and they give you a really interesting point. And often you don't know how to answer it. Like, I think about it and I'm like, that might be a valid point. It's crucial to say, hey, like, I don't know. Let me think about it or let me go look at it, right? And they think, I gotcha. But you need to go back and relook at the details, relook at why it's going to be different than you expected and try to figure out where your logic is wrong. So that challenging piece is there. The second cultural piece here to put in here. So my favorite quant teams I've been on have been those that are comprised of individuals who are very, very passionate about what they do. Uh, one of my all time favorite colleagues I have ever worked with, and I'll tell you a story here to kind of show you this, the passion drives both of you into the state of like a higher level and it ensures that you're not wrong when you have to sit in front of senior management or other teams that challenge you because you've already been challenged by someone who is very, very, I don't know, scrupulous or like they're so detailed into looking at like, they wanna catch what's wrong because A, it's our work, right? It's a team effort, our team work here. And I talk about this a lot, quants are teams. Um, but they, they nitpick everything apart and they try to figure out what's wrong with it. And I do the same for them. So we're always like at each other trying to figure out where the mistakes are and making sure it's done absolutely correct. And as a team, we have had amazing success as being just absolutely on top of things because we have that challenge, okay? If you don't have that challenge, like you have junior employees thinking that senior employees are always right, um, kind of that nasty hierarchy I see in a lot of places, it's not gonna work out well for you. Okay, so this, this colleague, I'll tell a story here, my favorite, one of my favorite colleagues, uh, he, is, he is older than me. He's old enough to be my dad. So <laughs> there's that much of a gap here just to kind of lay some of the groundwork and landscape here. But there have been many, many, many occasions, uh, we have big projects and whenever somebody does something and they don't understand it, or even if somebody does something and somebody doesn't agree with it, there's going to be an argument over it, okay? You can see I'm getting all excited because these are actually pretty fun for me, but sometimes I get my feelings hurt and I'll talk about that in a second, but there have been many occasions and I remember one specifically where it was like we're sitting in this room, it's just the two of us. Sometimes there's another colleague just hanging out, just kind of like enjoying the, the debates, but all right, so my colleagues on the whiteboard, right? We love the whiteboard, it's our favorite thing. On the whiteboard, just writing on the whiteboard, like saying, Dimitri, you were completely wrong and this is exactly why. And they're going through the math and they're like drawing diagrams and charts and showing everything. And I'm like, you're completely wrong. Let me explain why you're wrong. This doesn't make any sense. And I'm like going through the board and I'm trying to show them. And when I get excited and they get excited, I start talking higher than them. So I feel like I'm heard more and they start talking more. So they feel like they're heard more. And so it's escalating higher and higher. And like we're yelling and screaming at each other. You know, this is going on and on. You know, this isn't correct. That's not correct. And all of, <laughs> we have glass on this conference room and all of a sudden there's business people. So we have our quant team and a bunch of business people around. These business people are coming over and they're like leaning over, peeking around the glass. Like there's gonna be a fist fight, right? There is yelling and there is screaming and people are you know yelling and pointing and kind of marching back and forth and stuff. And so people are all concerned about this. And this has happened multiple times. I've got tons of complaints on my, our noise levels as a group here. But when you get so passionate, and even when it's like, they're like, Dimitri, you're a really smart guy, but you can't be this stupid. There's no way you're this stupid. Let me show you, right? Those times it can hurt my feelings. And I, you know, we always remember that, okay, it's a team. We're trying to do its best for it. Uh, again, it's two intellectuals, top intellectuals here. Both, I mean, both of us are super excited about it. We're both very knowledgeable. 
but trying to work out those nitty gritty details, that's what's elevated my game and my level. And in this story, right, a lot of times like arguing and finally we have some breakthrough or whatever and we come to some conclusion and then somebody, you know, picks up their phone and they're like, you know, looking, they're like, oh, it's like lunchtime, you wanna hit lunch? And it's like, yeah, yeah, let's go. And then like all the yelling and screaming stops and then we just pack our stuff up and we go to lunch. It's not a big deal. But that kind of culture, that kind of atmosphere, being with somebody who's at the very top and there's not very many of these people out there, guys. Like you can go get a quant degree, a master's, a PhD, you're not going to be, there's not a lot of them at the top. But if you can find someone like that and you're both reading textbooks, you're both super educated, you've both been doing this for years and you both challenge each other constantly, then when you go to present these things for final presentations and everything, and you're, I'm talking on YouTube about these concepts, right? We have argued, we have worked a lot of these concepts through and they seem simple. And again, it's in those textbooks and like, it seems like, oh, A equals B, like this makes complete sense. But it's not until somebody truly challenges you that you really grasp it. And so to answer that question here, that's how I became so good at quant finance. I believe I have that minimum IQ to kind of get things done, be a quant and everything. And it, it's kind of a piece of it. Um, but having that passion, having that desire, having the soft skills has made me really excited about it. And it's put me in positions where I'm able to argue intellectually with other people, but also being humble and realizing like, I'm wrong. Like when that meeting, when I was screaming and yelling, we're arguing, I think I was wrong in that one. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't realize this or my math was wrong. I thought this was this direction. And so we go it out and they're like, I told you, Dimitri, I've been, I've been thinking about this, you know, I've been going through this, trying to explain this to you for 20 minutes. And so those sorts of things, that's what drives you, makes you a better quant. Again, finding those people around you, finding intellectual debate is challenging. As I showed in the first example, some people get their feelings hurt. And yes, I was even told like in my annual review that they passed over me for a promotion because you know I don't respect senior management. I don't respect other people because of that one incident when I was yelling at this lady. But again, she's yelling at you back. So I feel like you need to be on equal playing fields. And then the second piece here, right, if you can find a team that accepts you and is passionate and excited too, you might have some heated arguments and things, but that should be kind of part of the job. That should be there to drive you and them together. So anyways, that's kind of answering the question here. That's how I've gotten so good at quant finance and time series specifically is having those debates and having those arguments. It really makes you think through your problems. So anyways, thanks for watching. If you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up below, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell if you want actual weekly notifications on when these videos come out. And as always, until next time.